Your support of the Candid Frame over the past 12 years has been invaluable to us. You have not only helped us produce over 400 episodes, but your donations directly helped us to create the Candid Frame app and making it available for free. We are now proud to announce the release of a new way for you to listen to TCF. We have released a new skill that is compatible with Amazon Alexa-enabled devices. Using voice commands, you can listen to the latest episodes, jump forward and back, and if you stop listening partway through an episode, it will remember where you left off. And like the Candid Frame app, it's free for users in the U.S. and Canada. In the coming months, the skill will be available in other countries. And I'll let you know when those become available. You can help and continue to support the work that we do here by contributing as little as $2 a month to our Patreon campaign. You not only help us to meet our cost of production, but provide us the means to improve the quality of the show and do so much more. Contribute today by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candid frame. This is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame. Though I took a few photography classes while I was in college, my real photo education came from photography books. I'm not talking about how-to books, but rather monographs, collections of the great works of master photographers. I was looking and analyzing the work of photographers like Joel Meyerowitz, Gordon Parks, Mary Ellen Mark, Lee Friedlander, Larry Fink, and hundreds of others that taught me so much. I learned about the intricacies of composition, the subtle use of light and shadow, and how to evoke intimacy from a subject. I didn't often succeed at meeting those high standards in my work, but I did develop a sensitivity to what's needed to achieve an exceptional photograph. William Albert Allard's book, The Photographic Essay, was and continues to be one of my favorite photography books of all time. It not only revealed to me what was possible with color and light, but it also provided me invaluable insight into what is required to tell stories with a camera. While he is best known for his lifelong work with National Geographic magazine, to many photographers, he has served as an ongoing inspiration for those of us who not only strive to tell stories, but also create beautiful pieces of art. I was lucky enough to interview him for the first time over seven years ago, and I considered it a highlight in my life as a podcaster. Now I got the chance to sit down with him again, this time face-to-face at the Leica Gallery in Los Angeles, to discuss his career and the release of his latest book, William Albert Allard Paris, Eye of the Flaneur. Bill, welcome back to the Candid Frame. It's a pleasure to really have you on the on the show. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. I can't believe it was seven or eight years since the last time I talked to you. It Time just seems does like fly. Yesterday. Yeah. And I think I told you then is that that um, I just love your photography. I, I, I like to say that there are a lot of people who have influenced the way I see, but there have been few photographers that have helped me to find the joy that can be had in photography. Because oh, yeah. I look at your photographs and uh, I have virtually all, all your books and I would return to them over and over and over again. Taking wow. a look at those, looking at your images, trying to decipher, you know, what voodoo you were working <laughs> to, to create some of your imagery. Well, and, thank you very much. That means a lot to me. Yeah, and it was, you know, always sort of fascinating not only to see a good photograph, but to be like, having that visceral reaction to, ooh, God. And I, I can only imagine that for, that's what I was experiencing looking at the images. Uh-huh. Was that kind of what you experienced when you were actually making some of those? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes. And sometimes, um, quite often, actually, that's the feeling I got with a picture I didn't get. But, mm. uh, and I've said that, <clears throat> Jesus, and I've said this before, you know, nobody gets them all. But what a pleasure I've had in my 50-year career, 50-plus now, actually, of having been able to see so many beautiful moments. Mm -hmm. I didn't get them all, but I saw them, you know. And and I'm trained to see them, you know. I I think that 
photographers, by we, by our nature, we do see things that a lot of people miss mm-hmm. because it's it's not their nature, you know. And with my Paris book, for instance, the, the title of which is "Eye of the Flaneur," which is a French term, the Flaneur, a uh, wonderful book by I believe it's John Morris, uh, or is it Edmund Morris? Case I should know, huh? But a flaneur is someone who goes out, a he or she, and just marries themselves into the flow of life, yeah. of what's out and about. And that's basically the way I've worked all my life. And fortunately, for the majority of my career, I worked for National Geographic magazine. And I, worked for, I was working for a publication uh, that would allow me that kind of time, you know, to go out maybe and, and have a... Well, the early days, maybe have five months on on an assignment. I wouldn't spend it all the same. I'd break it into two trips, maybe two months one and three three, three months on another trip. But to be able to go into an area, to go into the same cafe every day for a while, you know, it's in my kind of work. Now, I won't I won't say this is true with the Paris work because it was it was too scattered. But if I'm in a relatively small area. It's every bit as important for my subjects to get to know me as it is for me to get to know them or get used to seeing me. You know, because once, you know, the three most important things about uh, documentary photography or street photography or whatever, the kind of photography I, essays that I would do for Geographic, is uh, access, access, access. But there's one thing that's even more important, and that is once you have access, acceptance. Because once you have acceptance, then they start to give me the pictures. Many of my best pictures I didn't take, they were given. They allowed me into their space, and they, 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 they allowed me to make that picture. They gave it to me. Yeah, I think it's an important point to make, because I think some people, and I've heard people say it, that if I had a business card with National Geographic, I would be able to make those photographs. And, <laughs> and even if people had the skill level required, there still doesn't mean that those people are going to trust you yeah. with with right. their lives. Right. And, exactly. And, and the business card comes later. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't walk into a bar and put my camera on the bar. I, I'd, I'd walk into a bar very often, put my camera on the bar, but I didn't say, hi, guys, I'm Bill Allard. I'm with National Geographic. That's the last thing I'm going to do. <laughs> you know, I won't lie. If they say, oh, what are you doing? I'll explain to them, you know. But uh, no, no, no. Um no, it's, it's, uh, and you somehow have to project, and I've written about this years ago. I know my first, uh, assignment back in 1964, a long, long time ago, was to try to photograph the Amish of Pennsylvania, you know. You have to, uh, you have to have that acceptance, and once that acceptance is given, then you're, then you're on your way. Yeah, yeah. We, we we talked about that project before, and I, you know, it's always just sort of fascinating, considering that you know, as as we mentioned in that previous inter- interview, which I suggest people listen to after they listen to this one, was the fact that they had sent another photographer to try and document the Amish and had failed, and then they sent you yeah. out there. Yeah, they didn't tell me that. They that was I was a photographic intern. I didn't know anything about anything. I certainly didn't know anything about color. But Bob Gilko was then the director of photography when I walked into his office pretty much by accident one day in the spring of 1964. And I was a month or two months away from getting my degree from the University of Minnesota. I was 26. I was married. I had four children, ages one through four. Mm -hmm. And I needed a job. And he offered me this internship. And the last thing he asked me as I was leaving his office, he said, how do you feel about color? I said, doesn't bother me a bit. Which was totally honest. How could it bother me? I'd never done it. You know? but, <laughs> I bought a roll of color film as soon as I got back to Minneapolis. I still have that roll somewhere. But that I, I've always wondered about that. That you know that the way you gained access, and I wonder how much of it was a combination of naivete, and how much was it? Oh, I really have to make this work. This is my first assignment. I can't blow this. No, uh, in all honesty. I shouldn't say that, that there are replies that I'm not always speaking honestly. It, it wasn't naivete, and it certainly was, there was a bit of naivete. Naive, na, naivete is bliss in some ways, but it definitely wasn't, I have to do this. Mm-hmm. Because, first of all, I didn't realize how, I, 
I didn't know it, it was, this was supposed to be something difficult to photograph the Amish. When I was in school as a student, I'd take subjects that I wouldn't, I knew I might not be able to fully complete, but they would challenge me psychologically. Okay. I worked in an all-black, uh, high-intensity religious uh, uh, church that took place in a former movie theater on the edge of downtown Minneapolis. I never got full acceptance there. When I left, I thought, you know, I've done the best, but I, I haven't done it as well as I wish I could have because I don't think I was fully accepted. I think they were thinking maybe he's trying to pry into us uh, in financially or something like mm-hmm. that. But uh, I, I did other kinds of stories that would challenge me psychologically. And in terms of being accepting, it's what you project. I mean, somehow, and it's not theater arts. There, there can be a little bit of, of theater involved, if you will. We're always projecting. All of us are. Pro- all, we're always projecting something, you know, in some way. Um, some of us more than others. Somehow you have to project that you're not there to do them harm. You're not there to make them look ridiculous. Right. You know, just ask to be allowed to be there. Yeah. How about though, you know, once you get access, you're spending time with people and not sort of overstaying your welcome. Or, God, or, I hope I haven't you, done that. I like to think I haven't done that. But I think that that's something I try to face sometimes. You know, some, m- m- most of the time it's because I'm having momentary encounters with people on the street. Mm-hmm. And so I, mm. I don't want to overextend it. But sometimes I, I feel like I want to push it just a little harder mm-hmm. to ensure that I get the photograph to, to justify it. All the yeah, actions yeah, that, that can taken. happen, and uh, and also, you know, when you get that moment, I'm not about you, but you, when you get that momentary kind of rejection, it kind of sets you back a little bit. Mm-hmm. At least it does me. You know, I, I don't put my tail between my legs and slouch off into the corner someplace, but yeah. you know, and I, I've never had a really difficult moment with, in regard to someone's response for me making pictures. Mm-hmm. But again, as, I, as I've said, you don't need a doctorate in psychology to know if what you're doing is upsetting someone. And if it is, then you've got to back off. Yeah. yeah. So when you were you know, spending time with a family or a group of a community and photographing them, you know, how would you, because you had the luxury of time working for National mm-hmm. Geographic, yeah, but nevertheless, you, you, you just couldn't shoot anything and everything, and you had to sort of have a sense in terms of how the story story was shaping up in your head, because you didn't have the benefit of looking at your images at the end of the evening on mm-hmm. your computer. You were shipping all that film over mm-hmm. to, to the offices to get processed and yeah. be looked at by you know s- someone else. So how did you sort of process the day and figure out, what have I gotten? What am I missing? What, do I, what might I need? That's a really good question. And my answer is not a really good answer, unfortunately, because I don't think I intellectualized it that quite that way. You know, in the early days of Geographic, we, we really didn't have budgets. And I was just discussing that with my friend Garrett Ludwig the other, last, last night yeah. at dinner. You know, there was a time that budget was not a word that was ever used. And you went out and until you thought maybe you were done. It was a gut feeling, of course. Um, and I never worked off a shot list. I never had, because my, my work has always been pretty much go out and react to what you see. Mm-hmm. And I was lucky that way. I was, because I, I started that way. It worked for me. It worked for the magazine. So nobody was going to tell me to do it otherwise, you know. And then also, part of my career has been helped by the fact that I also can write. Yeah. I consider myself a good writer. Not a great writer, but a good writer. And good writing is hard work. But I wanted to be a writer before I wanted to be a photographer. So all my life, I've kind of had this this dual uh, passion for making images with words and with cameras. And uh, I did that uh, a number of times for National Geographic, also for other magazines. Uh, but especially for Geographic, uh, you can offer them the talents, if you have the talent to do it. Mm-hmm. There was a time when uh, Ed, when um, Grosvenor, Dr. Grosvenor, who was still heading the magazine, 
he couldn't write, but he thought he could. And uh, his stories were mostly ghostwritten. But his idea was, oh, if you give someone a typewriter, they can write, if they can type. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you give them a camera, of course, they can, they can photograph. Of course. Of course. And so there was a period of time when a number of photographers were given the duty to write, and they couldn't, and they shouldn't have been given. And then some poor editor back at the at the office had to rework something. But I could do it, and if you can do it and do it well, it takes a lot of stamina because your work is never done. But you can bring to that story a personality that's special, a little bit special because it's seen through one pair of eyes, it's felt with one heart, one mind, uh, if you can do it well, but as I say, it takes a lot of energy. I can remember and on some of my Western work, I might be sitting around 5 o'clock, which is getting to be dusk in the West in the winter time, and I'd be on a, on a side, a, a small road, eastern Idaho or somewhere like that, and I'm thinking, boy, in another 45 minutes, this light's going to be just beautiful. But... 45 minutes from now, I'm supposed to be 40 miles up the road to see someone with whom I have to conduct an interview and photograph. Mm -hmm. So it's always, it's like kind of trying to be tuned into two different frequencies at the same time. You have a lot of balls in the air, you know. And I don't, I, and I, I, I made up my mind. I, I would never want to do that as a general assignment person. I only want to do the things I really want to do. Right. And that's the way you keep the juices flowing. I didn't always have that in my career. I didn't have the luxury of always getting assignments that I really had a passion for. There was a time when I had a, I had a family, I had to make an er, a, a living, and I'd get assignments from Geographic that other people didn't want. They're not, they were not the dregs, but they weren't my first choice. But I took them because I had to. What what skills that you had as a photographer helped you as a writer? Let's reverse that question. Okay. Let's say, what skills uh, as a writer helped me as a photographer? And we'll go with the Hemingway-esque route. Okay. Again, cutting away the extraneous, getting rid of what you don't need. Very, very true in good writing, and absolutely true. And when I have this workshop t- this tomorrow afternoon, I'm sure I'll be looking at portfolios, and I'm going to say, what in the hell is all that stuff there in the left-hand corner, mm-hmm. you know? You're responsible for every millimeter Absolutely. of that. And what what shouldn't be in there is what shouldn't be in there. So get rid of it. And, and that's, and I, I, and I, you know, I have to pound away at myself to remember that too. And I look at my work and say, okay, Hollard, what the hell was that? Why didn't you, why'd you see it that way? Well, I think I, I, my photography improved as a result of doing just what you said, like parsing things out. But at some point I got, I said, how much more can I add to this and still not have it fall apart? That's you know? interesting. That's yeah. an interesting way of saying that. Yeah. How so, much that can you add without having it fall apart? Right. Because I because I train my eye to be very in control of the frame mm-hmm. by parsing things out in the way that you described and making sure that every element in there serves the subject or the moment. But then after a while, I saw found myself repeating myself. Mm-hmm. You know, and then it was like, okay, how can how can I walk that tightrope? Mm-hmm. And I was wondering if and when you had experiences like that. Well, the other thing is, uh, I'm one of the few, my generation, whose entire professional body work is in color. And I've always felt that, you know, color, uh, I, I don't have the designer's vocabulary to tell you why the yellow's doing that, why this is that. Mm-hmm. To me, color is very, very intuitive, you know. And also, the kind of work I do, I go out on the street. I have nothing. I have no influence on what somebody put on for clothes that morning, or what the light is. Uh, I've been quoted as saying there's no such thing as bad light, but obviously there is light that's better than others. Yeah. But still, it's use use whatever you got. Do the best you can with what you've got. If the light is hard and harsh, use those shadows somehow. But but in color, it's uh, it's so intuitive. I mean, if you put that red. Oh. I was yesterday. I was at the um, the museum here in town. I'm looking at Renoir, uh, Gauguin, several others, and noticing what the difference in their reds might be. Mm-hmm. Like the red of Renoir, you can just see it. It's a little rosy, you know, on the woman's lips and on the cheeks and that. And then the red on Matisse is going to be different. But anyway, but the red in the wrong place can blow the damn picture up. Right. 
you know, that's the thing. But often, you don't have time to make those kind of judgments. I mean, it has to be intuitive. In most cases, it has to be intuitive. Yeah. When I went to uh, Paris and um, I went to the, the Louvre, which is really overwhelming, but um, I went to the section where the Flemish painters were. Mm-hmm. And I was just, if that was the only thing I saw in that whole museum, it would have been enough. Because yeah. of the way um, they use light and shadow and the color in which. Sure, and, the, yeah. yeah. And it was, it was amazing to me to think of, I mean, I'd seen paintings, but for some, for some reason it didn't click that everything I'd ever been using or tried trying to use as a photographer had been used for thousands of years. And, and, and seeing it in the painting as mm-hmm. if we're like dis- discovering it for the first time. And yeah. then going, oh my God, they're using light and color and tonality and yeah. all these things to control where I experience yeah. the image, how I experience the yeah. painting. And I, every time I'm in Paris, uh, I don't always go to Louvre, but I always go to Musée d'Orsay. D'Orsay, that's yeah. my favorite. Oh, that that wow. is the place. You know, but yeah. now that you talk about you mentioned this, I often get... What, what they mean as a compliment, and I accept it as a compliment. They'll say, oh, it looks like a painting. Well, it's not a painting. It's a photograph. Mm-hmm. You know, I will, I'll go and look at painters. I love to look at painters, and I'll look at my photographs. No, they're just photographs. Mm-hmm. You know, I want them to be paintings. I, I want them to have that aesthetic, that whatever it is that draws you to it. But they're photographs. And I'm not, I, I don't want to pretend I'm a painter. You know, I mm-hmm. went to a professional art school, but one year only because I decided I wanted to be a writer. And in your first year of art school, you don't do any painting at all. You twist wires, cut up pieces of paper, and design yeah. and that kind of thing, you know. What, what, but I don't think I'd ever been a painter. Yeah, but what is it about the painting that you feel like is... What is the essence of that, that thing that you say that you're not capturing in your photographs that you see in the paintings? Do you have any... Any idea what that is? It's, I think maybe because, well, it depends what kind of paintings we're talking about. You know, if you're talking about impressionists, well, these, my, my photographs are just too, too exact. They're too mm-hmm. sharp. They're too this. They're too that, you know. Uh, I don't know. I'm kind of, <laughs> I kind of wish I hadn't brought that up because it's hard <laughs> to talk about. But a, I relate to painters. I relate to paintings. I love to look at paintings. Yeah. I just love to look at paintings. You know, and you know, I've got all these expensive books. I, I blow a lot of money on on art books, yeah. and those are the ones though that you can get. Oh, you'll still only get twenty five percent from the book dealer. Probably he won't even buy anything else you got, but they'll want mm-hmm. the art books. They're the ones that those the, the book used book dealers they want them, but yeah. they're only going to give you twenty five percent of that that hundred dollar book you bought. But what you know, but I I, I look at those books a lot. Yeah. I'm in answering my own question of that the only thing I can sort of think about is that because with a with a painter the very brush strokes that they they apply to the canvas is a form of sort of interpretation where a photograph yeah. that regardless of how in control the, the photographer is with this composition with light there's a still a literalness that's to, it. That's it. For the that's, that's what. That's the way I should have phrased it. There is a. <laughs> there is a literalness. Yeah. You know, uh, the the impressionism can work itself in there on certain photographs. For instance, I just did a very successful flash print sale on one of my. I guess my, one of my most iconic photographs goes back to the Amish or the Basque work in 1967. There are two little bass girls running down a village road. Yes, I know it well. And it was very soft light. Very, it was, I think it was probably made on ectochrome, which made it even softer and a little more pastel, you know. That has that kind of feeling. So the digital drive you crazy because it's even that more sharp, precise? Yes and no. Um, First of all, I'm the wrong generation for the digital age. I, I you know, it's uh, a camera is a camera is a camera. I can pick up that Leica Q and go out and, and it's got that wonderful autofocus, which is the best thing they've done for me in years, and work the camera. It's getting back on that computer that is the challenge for me. I can do some basic Lightroom processing, that kind of thing, but I can't. I can't do really. I, I can't do Photoshop and that stuff, but. There's two-sided coin, obviously. You know, you can see, you th- you think you can see what you got yeah. if you look in the back of the camera, but that's very deceptive often. 
is it really sharp? You know, well, you better take a little longer to make that decision to see if it really is and whatever. Then you erase stuff. I don't know. I, I probably make more. I probably make more images per working day yeah. if I'm I'm really working than I would if I film. Beginning next month, I'll be teaching a series of workshops where I teach my personal approach to street photography. In just a few weeks, I'll be teaching a course here in Los Angeles where we have two slots left. As well, I'll be in San Francisco in June at Street Photo SF. You'll find links for both uh, in the show notes as well as the Candid Frame website. We're also going to be scheduling a workshop in New Orleans for the fall, and we will be accepting students for that beginning next week. However, I'm going to be looking for the help of a local photographer in NOLA to serve as my local fixer during my time there. So if you are a NOLA photographer who knows the city well, I'd love to have you on board for our time there. You can email me with your information and samples of your work at info at thecandidframe.com. One of the things for me, because I, inspired by you, I shot countless rolls of Kodachrome. And I think that with Kodachrome, I knew exactly what I was going to get. You know, I could expose it a certain way, I could push it or pull it a certain way, but I, I knew that I could make it look a certain way and it would be consistent. With a raw file, uh, it can be interpreted any Ab- which absolutely. way. And absolutely. And sometimes, absolutely. And sometimes those choices... Mm-hmm. Is the problem <laughs> exactly. having such flexibility? Yeah. Well, that, that's why I, 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 I've all, I always said when I got into digital, I was still shooting for Geographic. There's a very good editor who's yeah. very sharp digitally, and he said, "Well, I'll, I'll tweak them." And I said, "Well, when you do that, I'm going to be there right back at, at your side, mm-hmm. because you know I don't want some photo editor thinking, okay, well, I'd like to make this a lot more blue.' He wasn't there, yeah. or she wasn't there. I was there." You know, I'm the one that would make that decision, and and I will I will go with what I feel it was like when I was there for the most part. I don't, yeah, you don't have to stretch the stretch the uh, medium that much. You were talking earlier about you know when you're shooting, you sort of um, you're in a scene, you're in a moment, you're seeing it play out, and you wait for that moment and you make the photograph. And before digital. Uh, you wouldn't know whether you got it or not. With digital, you have this immediate feedback. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is that a good or a bad thing, considering how you've been working for some? I know there's two sided coin. There's a, there's a, a good part to that because it may it may help you not fail to get close to what you wanted. Mm-hmm. But there was. There was nothing like the days of lining those rolls of film on the hotel dresser door, and they get up to a certain amount. I thought, okay, it's time to get them out of my hands. Uh-huh. I don't. I, I got to ship them. I don't want to be responsible anymore. <laughs> and then a month later, I might hear. No, I'll, hopefully before a month, I'd hear from a picture editor. In the days when picture editors were really looking at pictures, uh-huh. there was a time that, then that they kind of stopped giving that kind of feedback, which is not good. But the lovely thing about film was that when you got back, and those two little girls running down that Basque Village Road in 1967, I made two frames. Uh, I had turned, I'd heard these little patter patter of feet coming down the gravel. I heard a woman in the village had called out, and a few seconds later I heard this sound, and I turned, I see these two children. I raised my Leica, and I made two frames. And I got that rare gut feeling. But I thought, Allard, if you didn't screw that up, that could be nice. <laughs> well, two months later, I get back. I'm going through my film. There's two frames. One was blur, just nothing, and I trashed. I wish I hadn't trashed it now. I wish I still had it. The other one was magical. Yeah. And it's like getting a gift from afar. When you come back after that time and you find it there waiting for you. Mm. That's cool. Yeah. Digital's not like that. As you just mentioned, the, there was a big delay between you taking the picture and you actually seeing it. Mm-hmm. With digital, do you immediately want to get into the images? Do you create a delay in terms of between you taking them and... You well, if I were on them? assignment, for instance, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I'd want to look at it that night. 
And I forget what Geographic came up with as an extra per diem pay for looking at digital. It, was, it wasn't adequate, I'll tell you that much, because oh, you put yeah. you put a lot of time in. But no, I'd need to see, and I would, I'd, I'd have to look at it that night if at all possible. I, you know, I, I need to see it right away. And I don't know about that. What's the difference there between when I'd get back on film, I'd want to see everything right away. Uh, they would always have a number of selects for me to look at, and very often I'd look at those first, but I would definitely want as soon as possible to look at everything to get the, the disappointment out of the way. Yeah. Because almost always when I'd, I'd come back and I'd think, ah, oh, shit, I don't know if I've got anything worth anything, you know. I don't know if that was self-doubt. I have to, I have to live with the work a little longer. Mm-hmm. You know, I have to live with the work a little longer. Well, the the work in the exhibit and in the in your Paris book reflects a thirty year span or so. Thirty one years. Yeah, the years. earliest picture in there was done in nineteen eighty six, and that's the first time I really went to Paris with the idea of, of working. Yeah. So you said you signed a contract to, to produce the book a couple of years ago, and yeah. you produced a good number of images after yeah. you signed the contract, yeah. I, which I assume was during your your foray into digital. Oh, yeah. So I signed the contract in 2014. Okay. And the other day, uh, well, more a month or so ago, I, I was, I think there's 120 photographs in the book. I should know that, but I think it's 120. And I counted, I signed the contract to do the book in, with Lois Lammer Huber in 19, or 2014. And there are 41 pictures in the book that were made after that contract. So was in signed. terms of, you know, you want the, all the images in the book to be uh, uniform, cohesive, work off of each other. Did you find any sort of disparity between the images that you had shot before that you had shot during film and when you were younger to the ones that you had produced more recently after you signed the contract? Was it? No, I don't think so. No, okay. no I don't. No, I don't think so. Um, you know, you first of all, they came to me wanting to do a book of my work in Paris. It had never occurred to me to do a book on Paris because I thought, how am I going to do that? Who's going to do that? And then this wonderful, really quality publisher, Edition Lammer, you were, comes to me asking me to do it. Asking, and they wanted to do it right away. And I said at first, I said, well, can we wait a year or two? And mm-hmm. they said, no, we want to do it. So we, we actually waited six months after we, we were initially we were going to do it in the spring of last year and it came out in the fall but once I had agreed to do it then I thought my god I've got to I've got to do whatever I can to you know make it even better yeah so what did you think was and I excuse me but I didn't really answer your question I don't think from the work well there's only one or two photographs from the late well there's more than one or two from the late 1980s, because there's some fashion pictures which were done in 88. There's a street photograph that's, I think, a key to the whole body of work made of two street artists in the Latin Quarter. That was 1986. There's a handful from 88, and then we go on from there. Uh, But there's a cohesiveness, I think, to it all. Very definitely. First of all, it's all street work. Mm -hmm. What is not street work, you could say, might be Images from within the Musée d'Orsay, or possibly um, backstage at a fashion show. Right. I still consider that street because it is documentary. It's just there's maybe one produced photograph in the whole thing. I, I rarely make a produced photograph, but in 1988, when I was working on fashion for Geographic's All France issue. They had the not terribly uh, original idea of me hanging out with a couple of American models living mm-hmm. in Paris, which I did. Fine, you know, I'm not, uh, I didn't do any great work on them. I did some nice photographs, so. But there is one in the picture, and it's of this model named Tanya Polcott. She was, uh, I think, from Dallas out of St. Louis originally, and very attractive, blonde, great legs. And I'd seen her one day in this, I think it was a Betsy Johnson dress, which was a very short mini mini dress. Mm -hmm. Uh, And she had the nice legs to go with it, multicolored, but typical Betsy Johnson, really a lot of color. And she lived in an apartment. She had a room in an apartment that she shared uh, very... uh, 
non-sexual way with, with a young man, a young Frenchman, whose goal in life was basically to make collages out of pictures he'd cut up of Bridget Bardot and other people and make big collages. And mm-hmm. then once a year he'd go to the U.S. and buy a 1950s automobile or something, as I recall. Okay. So he, always, he was kind of self-sufficient. But I said to Tanya once, I said, I want to make a picture of you in that dress. So there is a picture in the book that you see Tanya. Uh, she's in black heels, sheer stockings. There, she's straddling some of these collages. You see Eduardo sitting over in a chair just looking at her. And she's got her hands on her posterior and moving them around a little bit. And I used a little bit of strobe to show some motion. Mm-hmm. That's a produced picture. I don't. I, I rarely, rarely, if ever, do that kind of thing. But it fits. Yeah. It fits. Yeah, you, you just mentioned strobe, and you know, I, I see some of your images that are are created not not just strictly from available light, but the subtle yeah. use of strobe. Not and, my, not many here. I don't think in the Paris book, but in general. There was a period of time that I was doing a lot of that mixed light. Yeah, and you're so adept at it in terms of making it so nuanced and not making it obvious. Because sometimes I look, because I would analyze those photographs and I'd be going, wait a second. Did he or didn't he? <laughs> yeah. I got, I, I got a very compliment from a number of my young friends who were in photography, but not necessarily working photographers. Because Harvey would do it very, he still does it very well, but for those Listeners, they can't see what you and I are doing, but I'm licking my finger and holding it up like testing the wind because that's basically how I figured the exposures. I mean, it was, it was hit or miss, but always with the idea that less is more. Just mm. touch it. Just brush the image with a little bit of light, uh, and it can make an amazing difference. Do you find that the highest ISO performance of today's cameras Eliminate the need to use a little kiss of flash, or do you still occasionally Man, use I it? tell you, I still have not taken advantage of that. I'm constantly thinking, why the hell didn't I kick up the ISO when I could mm. have? You know? And for, and for a long time, I think, well, maybe I'll put this at 400 or 800. And now they go to the moon, yeah. you know? And uh, hopefully without too much noise. But, you know, that's, that's I mean, that's, I was kind of considered, a, a maybe still am, a pioneer in color photography, partly because it, we get back to that ignorance factor or naivete. Mm, yeah. Ignorance is bliss. I came from a black and white, a, a very brief period in University of Minnesota where I shot black and white. I was working, I was driving a cab. I had to do most of my work at night. It was often in dim light. My negatives were really thin. And when I got into color, and at least in Tri-X, I had, what, 400? Yeah. My speeds were 25 and 64, maybe 120 on an ectochrome, which wasn't a very good film anyway. But Mm -hmm. I had to learn. (laughs) I just held the camera a lot steadier. Yeah. I absolutely did. And I would go and get pictures in available light situations that most color photographers wouldn't. And I'd have a lot of failures. I'd have a ton of failures. But I I, I wanted the viewer to feel that, they were seeing it as I was seeing it, you know, the feeling, the ambiance. Mm-hmm. As soon as you start putting a couple of lights or something in there, unless you're really, really good, yeah. you've changed the ambience. You've changed it. Now, the viewer might not know that, but I know it. You know, you were in a really competitive envir- environment at, at Geographic, and just in the magazine industry, p- period. Yeah. Um, how did that competit- competitiveness uh, help or hinder you? Oh, I think it, it always helps. Uh, and we, I don't know if the, I felt competitive with my colleagues like, uh, like Dave Harvey, Dave Allen Harvey, Sam Abel, uh, wonderful photographers. We, when we, at one time had a really tight group of friends and, and we'd have this thing, well, let's meet somebody at some place and tray up. Tray up. In other words, oh, okay. bring your carousel tray. Yeah. You know, well, maybe we're in a rent a motel room someplace and tray mm-hmm. up, you know. But it wasn't with a competitive aspect. You're going to think, well, I'm going to blow this guy away. It wasn't like the musicians. They used to say, well, they'll cut him up. You know, they'll, yeah. they'll, they'll, it, it was, it was great. Uh, it was a sharing and, and it was a sharing of, of, of caring about what you did. 
And then a, a short period of time, I went into Magnum. I found it, it wasn't really going to work out for me. It, it was a t- still a touchstone for a long time, and a lot of my the colleagues I really cared about were in Magnum. And Magnum, for instance, I think for Harvey, it's been great for Harvey, and he's been great for Magnum. It's not always right for everybody, I think, but it's nice to have a touchstone. It's nice to to have people that you care about, they work, and they care about yours. But I, I, I never worry about being the best. I don't know. There, that, that's not a thing that ever enters my mind. Being better tomorrow than I am today, that's mm-hmm. important. Why didn't it work for you at night? I was 50 years old. I just, I, I had married, and I was having a child at 50. And that's a little scary when you have a child at 50, because you want to live forever, and no chance are you're not going to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they had, a, and I took that very seriously about how much of your income have, would have to go into Magnum, and I wasn't making much income then. And uh, I'm not a very good joiner also. Maybe that's part of it. Ultimately, if I had stayed, I would have had a period where I'd have to figure out how to do it work at Geographic because there, there was a time when Magnum and Geographic couldn't quite come together because of ownership factors and whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'd be the first to say that my entire career has been structured around National Geographic, the Yellow Magazine. You know, it has been. Uh, it's been my greatest resource. I've worked for all kinds of different magazines at short short gigs, short periods of time, but the publication that gave me the opportunity to build my over, my body of work with National Geographic. Um, and I had a period where I was certifiably unemployable there, too, because I said the wrong thing, the wrong time, to the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> cost me three and a half years. And what, what was that about? What was that? Oh, jeez. that? Is it? Uh, my life was kind of scrambled then. My marriage had come apart. My I had an older brother had taken his life. Uh, cocaine was very popular among our group, rec- recreational use mm-hmm. of cocaine, let's put it that way. I don't think there were any addicts, but uh, I know there weren't any addicts. Drinking maybe a little bit too much. And, fr- and I came back from this Peru assignment, and I shot the lights out on that baby, 1981. Also, the first time I shot or anybody at the magazine had shot over a thousand rolls of film on a story. Uh, and I worked five months. But if I was conscious, I was working. <laughs> I was seven days a week, yeah. And I made a lot of mistakes. But I will say this. If I could put all those Peruvian pictures, 1981, back in the yellow boxes, put them all up on some shelves here, and you over there pick 15 of your best pictures, you go in there and and take 20 rolls at random on my yellow boxes and look through them. Mm-hmm. I'll better have one or two in there that won't match up with this guy over here. Yeah. Because I was, I was on it. But when I came back, then the word got around, oh, well, I shot a thousand rolls. And it went from kind of high to kind of low. And then they had a, a, a layout designer who was a, a different national, an Asian national. He wouldn't talk. You wouldn't talk, mm-hmm. you know, and you're laying out a story. You've got to communicate. That was a problem. And uh, so I show up at this uh, seminar meeting. It was a big meeting, which I wasn't supposed to be in anyway because I wasn't staff. And there'd been a lot of talk of, oh, we can't fly first class. And, oh, people are whining and whining about you can't fly first class and this and that. And like a dumbass, I pop up and say, I don't want to talk about first class airfare. I want to talk about first class picture editing. <laughs> and I said that to the editor. And uh, Melville Bell Grosvenor, the old white lion, was sitting right or row behind me, heavy breathing. <laughs> I'm not the smart thing to do. And that, that, that was stupid. That was self destructive. And it cost me about three and a half years of unemployment there. Mm. And that's when you find out. What you miss, how you miss doing something you truly love to do when you cannot do it. Ah, uh, yeah. The first year I, I sold some insurance policies to get by. The next year I did a couple of commercial jobs, one of which I don't think I've ever seen the film, and made very good money, but said, I don't ever want to do that again. But that's not why I became a photographer. So how did you get back in their good graces again? Uh, the director of photography retired. Bob Gilkin, we ended up still being friends, but it was a little harsh. He could have 
brought me back earlier. And Bill Garrett, the late Bill Garrett, who was the best editor-in-chief the magazine has ever had, he could have brought me back earlier, but they didn't. It wasn't until Rich Clarkson came became director of photography, he brought me back. So how did that, you know, after coming back, how, how did you sort of approach, you know, those moments where you may not have been completely jiving with an editor? I mean, you wouldn't go full bore now, but, well, but, you you're, know, still, but you're still who you are. There you're was a time that I had a reputation of probably being difficult to work with <laughs> in the layout room, you know, and it took me a while to realize you just can't walk in the layout, layout room and say, what the hell is this, you know? Mm-hmm. You, you know, you got to work with them. Uh, do the best you can to get your ideas of how it should look and make them think it's because of what they did. Yeah. You know, yeah. Has, has the challenge been for you, especially looking at your more recent work that you're doing primarily for, your, for yourself mm, yeah. rather than on assignment, yep. do you find that it's that much more of a challenge to edit your own work, even with all the experience that you've had? No. No, okay. No, and the other thing that you that you mentioned, my own work, I went pretty much through my career trying to satisfy myself. I always felt that if I can feel good about the work, the magazine's going to do well. Hmm. You know, because I'm I'm a pretty uh, tough self judge. You know, it's easy to fall in love with stuff. Uh, and you always, and I'm not saying I'd never need an editor. We, all, we always need editors. You always need a, a second opinion kind of thing. But I would do my best to do work that I felt maintained a certain standard, you know. Um, you had some back issues, which I can, I can relate to. Oh. Because yeah. I've had... Uh, I can't say that my spinal issues relate to the work. I don't know. They might have. They might have been born of them. It's a narrowing of the spinal column that I've got, spinal stenosis. Yeah, I've, I've, I've had sciatica flare-ups a couple of times, mm-hmm. which have d- taken me out. Oh, yeah. uh, more counts than I, I yeah. have won. But you know, it's, it's, it's resulted in me having moments when I get back into shooting again that sort of tempers it. And has somehow sometimes been a good thing. Yeah. Um, when I was recovering from a really bad bout, I was basically shuffling, and as part of my recovery, oh, really? I had to I had to start uh, walking in my. Um, in, I started walking in my neighborhood, but I would walk the same route day after day, and I would take a camera with me. And the challenge was: uh-huh. Can I find something new each day? I go out walking the same route in my neighborhood oh, until I could get to the point where I could walk a good distance and not have any problem. And I'm wondering when, when you've been recovering from issues with your back, as you've been getting, getting your body back, whether that, have you, if you've had something similar to that in terms of no, how it changes. No, but I'm, 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 I admire your self, the, the, the discipline and the way you approach things like that. I, the back issues I've had affected me once quite a bit, and it was in Paris mm. in 2013. I remember telling my assistant, we need to get a cab when normally I would have walked. Yeah. Because I'm not going to get the picture in the cab. But if I walk, I may get a picture between where I am and where I'm going. And I've jumped out of a cab to make that happen. Mm-hmm. But no, that my back, that, that was a bad period for me when walking could be really uncomfortable. And I, I guess I've just learned to live with it now. I do, uh, I do uh, <laughs> embarrass with my wife because she'll wait if she's in group eight or five at the airport or we're in that group. I go to the front, <laughs> tell the girl I've got spinal stenosis. I'm 80 years old. I need to sit down. <laughs> and and, and Ani says, yeah, and you bend over a little bit farther, too, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I might play that a little bit. But, hey, my dues are played, paid with air travel. I don't know. Air travel, oh my God. anything. They owe us a lot. <laughs> I can't imagine how many tens of thousands of miles you've traveled. Oh, not nearly as much as some of my friends. I haven't been in nearly the numbers of countries that... That many of my friends, I've been in maybe 30 countries, possibly 40. Was that largely by choice or what? Well, for a long time, I was, I was the American photographer. But some people thought, oh, he's that American. Oh, yeah. Because I was a, had a long love affair with the American West. I would go to other places, for instance, Paris. But for the 70s and right through the 70s and into the early 80s, I, if I could get out West, that was, hmm. that was my deal. 
So with this book of, of Paris, when you look at it now, and you get to, you know, anytime you get to see your your work collected, either in an exhibit or in Paris, when you finally saw the book and you went through the pages and you saw some of the images, uh, was there anything that surprised you? No. Although when I look at the Paris book, Eye of the Flaneur, uh, I am so grateful because uh, I was able to pick the paper. It's beautiful paper. The reproduction is, it puts some of my other books a little bit to shame. Yeah. I'm proud of all my books. This is the seventh. But this is by far the best rep- produced book that I've, that I've had. And uh, every time I look at it, I, I really feel good about it. Oh, good. That's a good feeling. Yeah. No. I, well, and books... Books are the finest outlet for for me. I consider the books the finest outlet for a still photographer. I mean, this exhibit I have here at the wonderful Leica Gallery in Los Angeles is wonderful. It's going to come down May 13th. You know, most exhibits are up for a month and then they come down. A book, a book is in your hand. As a friend of mine says, the best thing about a book is it's around forever. Mm -hmm. Of course, the worst thing about a book can be it's around (laughs) forever. And I tell young photographers and middle-aged photographers that I might have in workshops, there's always somebody in the workshop that wants to do a book. Whether they're ready for it or not, Mm -hmm. they want to do a book. And I just tell them, okay, book's wonderful. I believe that it's it's my choice of of outlets. But remember, a book can break your heart. You know, Mm -hmm. I do a book and it goes south. It's really... Didn't work out very well. Nobody's going to come down the street and say, "Hey, Bill, wait a minute. We saw your book. Damn, it's not very good. But we'll, we're going to do it and get it right." Uh, uh-uh. uh, it's yeah. over. It's over. A book is a one-time thing, so mm-hmm. maintain as much control as you can can get because you want to feel good about it. Absolutely. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is: I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore, and it can be anyone, someone you've long admired, just or one. someone, just one. Or someone you've recently discovered, so. Oh, recently, no. It could be, I'll like, give you more than one. Recently you discovered I can't do because I haven't been looking at many photographers okay. recently. I've been looking at more, I'm always looking at more painters than I am photographers. But people, I, one photographer I would always recommend because I, I think his work has evolved so well is Alex Webb. Yeah. You know, when I first looked at Alex, uh, Alex, and I'm, I'm, I, I, I hope he would not take this as in any, in any way offensive, but his graphics were wonderful. As he evolved, his graphics became he, always wonderful, and the content increased too. So mm-hmm. it's he works in layers. He does some yeah. wonderful things. My friend David Harvey does great work. Yeah, two of my favorites. Oh. There's an awful lot of them out there. Oh, no shortage. <laughs> I'll, well, be, I'll be at this for a very long time. <laughs> Well, I could talk to you forever. This has been great. Thank you, Bill. I really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. You ask good questions. Thanks to Bill for sharing his time and his story. You can find out more about him and his work by visiting WilliamAlbertAllard.com. And you can check out my review of his latest book on our website with a link to purchase it through our Amazon affiliate. And a special thank you to my friends at the Leica Gallery and Store for helping to make this conversation possible. If you are ever in Los Angeles, you should definitely visit this space, which showcases some remarkable photography. Visit the site at LeicaStoreLA.com. And you can also show your support of The Candid Frame by writing a review in the iTunes Store. As people search for podcasts to listen to, these reviews can lead people to listen to us for the very first time and can make all the difference. So if you haven't already, please take the time to do it today. You can also support the show by making a monthly contribution through Patreon. And for as little as $2 a month, you can help us to not only meet the cost of production for the show, but allow us to improve our podcast, YouTube channel, and website. Or if you just want to make a one-time contribution to the show, you can do so via PayPal. You'll find links for both on the Candor Frame website or the show notes. To access our complete archive of interviews, download the free Candid Frame app, available for Apple iOS and Android. Not only will you immediately receive the latest episode on your phone or tablet, you can also easily share your favorite episodes on your social networks and help spread the word. And if you want to drop me a line with comments or suggestions for the show, you can email me directly from the app. Download it today by clicking on the link in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. 
Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at the other martintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty free music can be found at incompetech.com. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at simply at Ibadian X. And this is Ibadian X, and this is The Candid Frame. <laughs>